I'm going to try and touch upon all that you've done in some way or another, and it's, it's actually too much, but I'm going to do the best I can. I mean, I feel the same way. Do you feel the same way? Okay, good. I mean, over two dozen anthologies, four books of poetry, two or three books of criticism, head of the NEA, businessman. I'm going to give you a more uh, thorough interview but I, um, um, uh, tomorrow night. Um, but I'd like to start with this question. If we could just go back maybe to start with here to the beginning of your career. Uh, as Bob Dylan might say, you started out in business but soon hit the hardest stuff, poetry. Um, there are several precedents for such literary transitions. Allen Ginsberg, Hart Crane, James Dickey, Wallace Stevens, who remained a businessman, T.S. Eliot, all started out and some remained as businessmen. You began your career working for General Foods, where you worked your way up to vice presidents of marketing. And in fact, you're credited with reversing the long running sales decline of Jell-O. A huge feat. What compelled you exactly to turn from po biz, I mean biz biz, to po biz? Well, I went into business to be a poet. Uh, I was a oldest kid in a kind of poor working class family in LA. And uh, my parents were wonderful people, uh, but they neglected to give me the private income I so richly deserve. <laughs> Um, you know, I, um, you know, and my, my folks were, I mean, to the day they died, God bless them, they were always broke. You know, they were always, you know, on the, the very, you know, cusp of financial ruin. And so, you know, I went on, you know, and I, I, I'm probably like everybody in this audience is that when I was in adolescence, you know, I knew I was different from the other boys and girls. Uh, I don't mean that in the usual gay narrative sense. Um, it was just that, you know, things, beauty just knocked me out. I mean, music knocked me out. Poetry just gave me, made me dizzy in a way that it just didn't to most of the people around me. And I kind of understood that I was part of a different tribe. And it, I spent most of my life trying to figure where the hell that tribe lives. Um, and so I went off to Stanford thinking, I was the first person in my family to go to college, thinking I was going to be a composer. I went to Harvard you know, by that time, graduate school in literature, by that time I knew I wanted to be a poet. And after a couple of years at Harvard, and I love, I'm, I was one of these really sick people who loved graduate school. You know, I mean, I just, no matter how erudite and abstract the conversation got, I just loved it. But it, suddenly it, it occurred to me, I had a kind of a Homer Simpson moment, you know, mm. duh. Mm -hmm. um, when I realized that, I was being trained to write poetry and write about poetry in a way that the people I came from couldn't understand. And what I've always wanted to do, and it's it's you know it's a kind it's a vague kind of goal, which is how do you um, write poetry in a way which has the highest standards but doesn't exclude people. You know, how do you get something that, you know, non-literary people can respond to, but a literary person could bring very, you know, serious levels of scrutiny and say, that's, you know, that's the real thing. And so, I'd, you know, I'd had shit jobs since I was nine, and so I became the first person, probably the only person in human history, who went to Stanford Business School to be a poet. Uh, and when I went there, my wife, whom I met at business school, will swear on a stack of Bibles that no one ever got through Stanford Business School doing less than I did. Um, and I wrote, but because every day I spent three hours reading poetry and writing poetry, studying poetry before I did my, my work. And then I went to General Foods and for the next 15 years, I wrote pretty much every night except Friday night uh, and every weekend while holding on a job. So it was really, it was like Stevens and Eliot in that it was our way of just paying the bills mm -hmm. while figuring out who you were as a poet. I mean, I, I, when I started working at General Foods, it was very clear to me that I did not write as well as I wanted to. You know, how did I teach myself to write better? I also had the sense that the models that were around me, the, the poems that were of the moment, 
mm-hmm. were not my kinds of poems. Mm. And so I had, it took me, it was good for me to have all that alone time. For seven years, I didn't publish anything. Mm-hmm. I didn't publish any verse. I published a few, a few reviews. Um, and I was, during that time, I wrote and rewrote poems every day. Mm-hmm. And I kind of groped my way uh, towards, you know, towards what I, the direction that I needed to go. And I kind of began to discover, in a sense, who I was as a poet. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was good. I was glad to work in business. Uh, I think it was good for me because I was, I was such, you know, to use an old-fashioned term, such an egghead, you know, a nerd, um, you know, so academic. And it was just good for me to spend year after year around people who weren't, who are were smart people, interesting people, but, you know, they weren't professors of literature. They didn't talk that language. They weren't interested in those things. And it gave me a sense, you know, to, you know, to root myself in the, in the experience of people that were hmm. not part of my little aesthetic tribe. Mm. It's a very long-winded answer to your very simple no, question. That's, that's, that's one. Um, you, I think you published your first book in 86? In a, yeah, 86. In 86, um, which uh, is um, the wonderful book, A Daily Horoscope, and um, a, a really gorgeous book. Um, a lot of influence there, I think, with a bishop and Donald, Donald Justice. We're going to talk, maybe talk about yeah. this a little bit later, but it was a, at a time when several people were turning back to formal poetry, and you were known as one of the new formalists. Um, um, maybe, yeah, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that, since uh, that first book was well, celebrated was, so much as a formal book. You know, see, I had the, the I guess, with the, the good fortune yeah. of having been attacked from the moment I started publishing. I mean, since I would publish something, there would be, you know, the, the tip, the perfect article on Dana Joya at that period would have been called Dana Joya, Threat or Menace. Uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> it's you know, a difference. The, and so, and, and it was, it was, it struck me as kind of, of paradoxical because, you know, you know, I was trained in music and I still think of a poem as largely a musical construction, a kind of type of heightened musical speech, a kind of song. Mm. You know, the, Mendelssohn wrote song, you know, without words. Poets sort of write songs without music. Yeah. The music's in the words. And p- part of the thing that I did is, you know, my parents were, you know, you know I was based with people who didn't speak English pretty much as their native language, but they actually liked poetry. Hmm. And they would quote poems and things like this. But one of the things they loved about poetry was the physicality of meter, of rhyme, of you know things like this. As this great conveyor of emotion. I mean, this old, you know, my, my, one of my old uncles, you know, would sit down and say, you know, he would go on and on about how inf- inferior Shakespeare and Milton were to, to Dante. Now he had never read Shakespeare and Milton, I don't think, but he knew Dante. So, Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritro-, you know, and he, you know, um, <laughs> you know, and so. Um, and so I had this, I thought, a kind of a real root in, in that experience. And so uh, I thought, actually, my poems from the very beginning have fallen into thirds. One-third in free verse, mm-hmm. one-third in rhyme and meter, and one-third in something most people don't do, which is meter without rhyme, which I really love. That's actually, mm-hmm. I just love the, you know, kind of yeah. having the music, but having it sort of slightly low-key. A lot of your dramatic monologues yeah. are... That way, yeah, and and mm-hmm. uh, so I was actually just struck me as if you're writing at the end of the 20th century, why do you want to give up anything? You know, why don't you want to do everything mm-hmm. that you're allowed to do? Mm-hmm. But you know, I began to be attacked, and they attacked me because I was elitist. You know, uh, you know, some, it was this was white male European elitist poetry. Now, a couple of years later, rap hit, mm-hmm. and that argument kind of fell to pieces. But I was doing it because I thought that was one of the ways in which I could, in a sense, engage the imagination of the kind of an intelligent, non-literary crowd. I mean, you know, face it, I mean, um, the real audience for poetry in the United States, you know, it's people, you know, people that are like us today, this kind of, this tribe, you know, we're very small. And, and we want to talk, have the conversation with each other, but I think that we also, in a sense, wanted to... Uh, open the broader conversations with the culture. I mean, poetry is the oldest form of literature, of human art of any kind. It goes back before writing. It goes back into kind of a primordial human culture in which there was one art, 
and it was the art which you made with your physical body. You sang and danced and chanted words to this rhythm. Mm. I mean, that's what rap is in a sense. It's a, re, a reinvention with contemporary technology of this primal kind of human art. Mm. In, a, in a crass and uh, commercial way, that's what Dancing with the Stars is. I mean, people like to see other human beings in a sense caught in a kind of rhythmic rapture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, and so I, I love that. And, I, and, and I, I, the older I get actually, the more I judge a poem by its physicality. Mm. You know, can I, can I feel it in here? Mm. You know, can I, do my, does my body want to move with it? Right. Which isn't to say that I'm writing, you know, you know, uh, yeah. you know hip hop poetry or whatever, but I want to be able to, you know, hear this. I mean, I heard an actor once, and, you know, and I'd never heard this until, you know, I was in my 50s. Maybe, maybe every one of you know this. He says, you know, and it, it, it's, it's a two-part explanation. He says, you know, iambic pentameter, you learn is da-dum, 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 you know. But what it really is, is... And that's the first part, but then it gets more interesting, and, and, and this is really quite true with actors. Shakespeare is synchronizing the language with his body, with his heart, and if he does it well enough, it synchronizes the audience's heart and body with that language. And actors will tell you this when they do Shakespeare. Um, th for the first couple minutes, the audience doesn't understand what the hell they're saying. But the audience gradually synchronizes themselves with this, and then even if they don't intellectually understand what's going on, they feel it. Mm. They intuit it. Mm. They understand it in a broader human sense. Mm. So I think the rational mind is grossly overrated in poetry. Yeah, yeah. Robert Bly would say the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, since you're talking about this. Which I should gonna... say, it's not an excuse to be stupid. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's the, it, to speak to the fullness yeah. of, human, uh, of, of the human resources. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here and just stay on this. Well, you, stay can, on, you can stay bring me this. back so to a Let's you know, just to... jump, jump around here, because I do wanna get back to um, your departure from business and that, that uh, interesting uh, transition you made um, at some point. But in your, in your essay, Disappearing Inc., uh, in the book by the same title, you quote the British classicist Eric Havelock, quote, acoustic rhythm is a component of the reflexes of the central nervous system a biological force of prime importance to orality. And then you go on to say yourself, metrical speech not only produce, produces some heightened form of attention that increases mnemonic retention, but also seems to provide innate physical pleasure in both the auditor and orator. Typographical poetry may provide other pleasures, but it cannot rewrite this, the circuitry of the human auditory perception to change millions of years of preliterate sensory evolution. Um, you go on to make the strong argument that the preservation and progress of formal poetry in your essay, even if that means incorporating such popular poetry as rap and cowboy poetry into literary poetry, uh, is essential. Do you feel this is happening? Um, or that's is, that's is brilliant. Happening? Who wrote it? Uh, uh, you no. did. Um, yeah. but, uh, and I just, I'll just, that's a kind of a two-part well, question. Well, um, yeah, I do, I do. Uh, let me start off with, a, yeah. a, you know, my, this is a syllogism. A, my mother was Mexican. B, my father was Sicilian. You, you take those together as a logical proposition. C, they were always fighting. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you know, my family had operatic arguments. But you know, sometimes my father would like put a 78 on, grab my mother, and then they would start to dance yeah. in the kitchen. Yeah. And she would smile, he would smile, you know, all the... You know, the yeah. tension would drain away. And what was going on was, you know, a, you know, a, a form of enchantment. Yeah. You have the enchantment of rhythm, of acoustic magic that puts you into a kind of trance state, which allows different things to happen than in your, you know, ordinary, harried, too busy human state, too preoccupied human state. I think, and this is my idée fixe at the moment, that what poetry should be, 
uh, is an, an enchantment, that you create a slight hypnotic state in the, the listener, in the reader, um, and that allows people to sort of to drop all of the defenses that we have to put up just to get through the average day on this planet um, and be vulnerable, you know, be closer to your memory, your imagination, your physical body, your intuition. And that, that's the, the key transaction of poetry. Now, there's different ways of doing it. Whitman does it differently from Longfellow. Um, mm. And... You know, you can, you, you know, but you do it in a sense by creating that kind of rhythm. And it does seem to me that right now, um, our culture is going through an enormous transformation. I think it's almost entirely misunderstood because most of the voices that we hear explaining it to us are people who are trying to sell us things. Uh, Apple, uh, uh, you know, MTV, uh, CBS, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's happening as I see it, now, and I, I don't you know, claim to be, be uh, clairvoyant on this, but this is the very really obvious, is that we have a visual culture that's enormously powerful. Young people today are so much more visually, not simply literate, but virtuosic compared to anybody who, you know, you might have had, you know, Picasso mm -hmm. a hundred years ago, but you have this enormous, enormous sophistication uh, and capability there. Uh, that is what the internet is. That's what this culture of screens are. The position of language in the culture of screens is largely headlines and captions. If you think of language as long, extended, sequential, logical things, that's breaking down. Where language has gone is into the new oral culture, the new auditory culture, mm. the culture of recorded music. Mm. Uh, you can even say radio. Mm. If you, you know, uh, writers should all go on the radio. Why? Because radio loves words. Radio loves talk. You can't possibly give radio more words than it needs. Uh, and you can do extravagant things there. And so the question is, if you're a poet, where are you going to go in this kind of cultural split? And I think, ironically, and once again, nobody believes me with this, but I really do think it's quite true. I think it's a very good time to be a poet. Hmm. I think people are actually, because of things like hip-hop, because of things like pop music, uh, even to a certain degree, a certain kind of radio, uh, they're used to hearing language -ish, you know, sort of shaped sound moving through time. And so I think that to the degree that a poet can, in a sense, capture that cultural moment, mm. um, you can communicate with people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, let me let, wait, 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 say one thing. I mean, yeah. what's, how do poets publish nowadays? What's the, mo the biggest mm -hmm. common way they publish is probably the poetry reading. Yeah. That's yeah. where they, they actually, most poets reach most of their listeners' readers. And it's a kind of direct transaction. It's not much different than what mm -hmm. Homer's situation would have been. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel this has happened? Uh, well, or what would you say to? I'm going to bring up the free verse poets here, just as a kind of um, uh, in a sort of dialectical way in this argument. Um, free verse poets who feel that metrical speech maybe fails to capture what. Philavine calls the simple truths. In a poem uh, by that title, he, he writes this. Things you know all your life that are so simple and true must be said without elegance, meter, and rhyme. And I go back to James Wright after his two formal books at the end of the 50s, St. Judas and the Green Wall, where he says, I just can't write that way anymore. Um, I've got to invent what he called a new imagination. And he and Bly, of course, you know, ended up writing the 50s and sort of introducing a whole new era of free verse poetry. So, um, and, you, and you write in free verse. Yeah, oh, I mean, so what do you, I, how do you, I, how ask, do you balance you know, these two things? questions? First of all, is why is free verse and um, is that something that, that is, ex that liking free verse mm -hmm. excludes liking magical verse? I see no reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of something like, I love subtraction, 
but you won't find me doing addition. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's sort of like, well, don't yeah. they kind of go the same yeah. way? So it seems to me what poetry is is a way of taking language and shaping it, I think condensing it, uh, and imbuing it, mm -hmm. you know, with emotion, you know, with, with energy. Uh, and there's different ways of doing that. And, uh, I've, you know, I write free verse. I write metrical verse. I don't see why they're in opposition. Mm. I mean, what I do think happens is when a poem comes, one of the first things, you start he feeling it coming, you start feeling the language. What mm. is the shape the poem wants to take? And I think a, a real poet should, in a sense, let the muse, let the language, let the inspiration shape itself. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if, if I was going to talk about somebody like... Um, I, mean, I think Phil Levine is a really interesting example. Levine he starts off at Stanford studying with Ivor Winters, yeah. you know, the, the rational formalist, you know, uh, who is an extraordinary uh, sort of personality. Levine and all of his students, you know, sort of you know, fall under his sway. And I think what happens with Levine is he realizes very early on that he's not writing the way he wants to write mm -hmm. in that. And in, in Levine's case, I think it's, he became a free verse poet because his free verse is better than his formal verse, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's where he got the energy. And so I think for every, I mean, this is, I mean, there's certain kinds of poems I would love to write, but I can't write them well. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I choose to write those poems which I can write well. And so you know, the sec, so you know, so what I think a, a poet should do is, in a sense, you try different things and you see where your talent, your interests lie. The other thing that happens is that 20, 10, 20 years later, mm -hmm. this may be something else that yeah. you want to do. When I give, um, I don't teach writing very much. Um, I usually, try, I prefer to teach literature because the students, even the writers, haven't read enough and they need to read more. Uh, but when I do teach writing and I give, the, and they say, oh, I don't want to do these, oh, why do I have to write a sonnet? You know, I, now personally, I don't really write sonnets. I mean, but I think it's something that's interesting to learn. At the end of the class, every one of them tells me, "I'm so glad we did this formal stuff. I really realize I'm good at this. I'm good at that." And that's the purpose: is you try, you give them ten different things, mm -hmm. two or three of which they would never have tried, and they actually discover that it brings forward parts of their imagination that other things right. don't do. Yeah, but I think a poet should be open to every possibility that language allows. Yeah. Um, you were talking about what an exciting time it is to be a poet, poet now. Um, in, in your essay uh, a couple decades ago now, uh, Can Poetry Matter? You, know, you talked a lot about the subculture of poetry, uh, a very courageous essay that was also very prophetic in many ways. Um, can you say at this point that one of the reasons that poetry has become so marginalized, and you make that same sort of argument in your, in your essay, is that it's just not an essential component of our national consciousness. So speaking here sort of in a larger social uh, context, despite the thousands of poets who are writing in what you call the subculture of poetry, poetry seems to thrive most in cultures where there's little else to hold on to except the witness and pleasure of poetry. Now, Carolyn Fourchet, who was here last year, um, um, documents this in the uh, this legacy of uh, poetry um, as a as the spiritual sustenance in times of persecution and oppression. Um, so, I guess my question is: uh, Can poetry and prosperity coexist? It's a it's a very complicated question. Um, if you, I happen to know England pretty well, yeah. because when I quit my job um, in business, you know, and I had to make a living as a writer, which I did for about 15 years, and actually I still sort of do. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. that's why one of the reasons I don't teach full time. I don't want to lose the discipline of having to write for a, to, for a living. I did, did a lot of work for BBC, and Eng, in England, uh, there is a much bigger audience for contemporary poetry. Um, you know, poets like Betjeman, Wendy Cope, uh, mm -hmm. Philip Larkin, people like this, they, their uh, books, Stevie Smith, become bestsellers. In Ireland, too. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. 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 And, you know, and so, uh, and they're quoted in the media, and, they're, and there are modern poets that are pretty much known by the full public. The United States is a little bit of this that's still coming on. I mean, I, uh, 
you know, you'll, you'll still see this, but, it, but there's not that many poets that have broken through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it has a, a combination of things. I think it's a, I think it's a failure. We have a, a huge cultural problem in this country, which is that the ac in universities and academies, we have some of the smartest people in society, but the profession over the last 60 years has become much more inwardly focused. These are people who are very good at talking to one another. I mean, I realize this is the NEA. I, I needed a hundred people that could explain to a reporter, to a politician, to a, you know, to a mayor, to a business person, why reading novels mattered, why studying poetry mattered. And I couldn't find them in the university. <laughs> Those people were very, I would put them in front of them and they would start going off on some tangent and I could just see the person's eyes roll over. Uh, you tended to find some of them in journalism, some of them sort of in, you know, freelance writers, but we've, we've the, the tradition of the literary public intellectual in the United States uh, has, has just imploded. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem. I think our educational system, I mean, good God, you know, uh, if you, I could give you the statistics, but I don't want to see a grown man cry, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a problem. And then the media has grown ever dumber and more vulgar. Um, and so, you know, we're, so we are, mm -hmm. we are, that's why we're here. We're here not just to learn to write, but we're here to keep our sanity, aren't we? You know, because they say like, you, uh, <laughs> we have dedicated our lives to something that our neighbors see no value in. And, uh, we, uh, now we know the value and we have to do a better job of articulating it. And we have to change some of our tribal folk ways in order to do this. You know, I'm in, you know, I was in some ways a persona non grata in the creative writing world. In fact, there are some people that have never spoken to me since that essay. Uh, because they felt that, you know, in some way I had criticized these people, you know, that I've taken this already persecuted minority of poets and I've made it life harder from them. I don't think so. I think, I think a writer must always try to tell the truth. Uh, mm. And uh, I don't think there was anything cheap or cruel in that essay, but I was trying to understand what was happening mm. in my own time, in my own country. Mm. Uh, we have the power to create the society in which we want to live. But in order to do that, you know, we have to change things. And sometimes the change begins with ourselves. Mm. I want to just touch upon a few things that you yeah. did in the, at the NEA. Um, um, uh, to follow up on this, in addition to conducting that readership survey um, in 2002, in which you found a 20-year decline in literary reading, I think what did, you, what did you finally find that was like eight percent of pub public or seven reads literary? Uh, well, well the, the, the reading, the, I tried to sum it up in three sentences so that even a senator could understand it. Um, <laughs> the, the Americans are reading less yeah. because they read less, they read less well, and reading less well has extraordinarily important consequences to education, uh, to democracy, to the economy, and to the social fabric. Okay, very nicely put. Um, uh, so, so, but so the, about half the population still reads novels. Uh, somewhere less than 10% read poetry, it's about 7%. It, that, it, it's such a small number, it, it actually jumps around a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, hardly anybody reads plays, and surprisingly few people go to plays. Yeah. So fo following this survey, you- 9% go to plays. <laughs> you proceeded to undertake a few other projects at a time when many Republican congressmen in particular were calling for the elimination of the NEA uh, as a government agency. Those projects included the Big Read, which became a, the largest literary project in the history of the government, Poetry Out Loud, a recitation contest that now involves almost 400,000 high school students across the country, um, and culminates in a $20,000 college scholarship for the winner. Uh, the NEA Jazz Masters Program, which is the nation's highest honor in jazz music, equivalent of the Pulitzer, 
Shakespeare in American Communities, and Operation Homecoming. And I probably left out some things. Um, writing the wartime experience. Um, at the start of your tenure as chair of the NEA, you announced that it was time to change the conversation uh, about the controversies of the NEA and put aside partisan issues and politics about art in the new millennium. Business Week called you the man who saved the NEA. It sounds like you killed Congress with kindness and initiative and savvy. So I, you stepped down in 2009. Do you feel that that initiative that you, that you brought about so heroically has continued uh, and has made a difference? We, uh, when I, during my years, we increased the budget of the NEA every year. We, we launched the largest programs in our history. Uh, and more importantly, we created partnerships. The Big Read had 25,000 other organizations that did it in partnership with us, which is why after we had that launch nationally, for the first time in 22 years, American reading, literary reading went up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, you know, Poetry Out Loud, we, you know, just, you know, probably Poetry Out Loud is, is, is bigger than the American poetry, you know, world. I mean, yeah. and we're, you know, producing millions of high school kids who memorize and recite poems in competition. That will enrich the audience for poetry. It will en enrich the, the culture for every poet. So we did these wonderful things. Um, it would be, it, it, I feel it would personally be improper for me to critique my successor. But I think right. you can look at the decline of the budget, Is the breakup decline, yeah. of the bipartisan consensus and the uh, curtailing of a lot of the programs to suggest it's, it has been uh, an unsuccessful uh, six years. Mm hmm. Hmm. Um. <laughs> um, well, congratulations on all those amazing accomplishments. I hope that they stand as an example well, to future. Be, you know. what, what I was trying to do was a couple of that. I was trying to change the conversation mm -hmm. about the importance of the arts and arts education. Yeah. Uh, basically, on a grassroots level. I mean, uh, who, what, you know, you were talking this, what mayor, what congressman does not want uh, those things, does not want creativity, uh, education of the imagination, uh, those things in their community? It, it improves the schools, it improves the economy, it, it improves the culture. Um, and you just had to find, in a sense, a rhetoric, uh, to, you know, as, as, right. you know, as we heard in the earlier presentation so eloquently, to, to be able to do this. But w what I also wanted to do is I wanted to provide an example that if you sat down and you did it right, you could make it work. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole notion, I mean, here's, here's one of the things I hate, I just hate about arts people. This is, you know, when they, come, when they come into my office, they would have this conversation. They go, hey, hey, things have never been worse. You know, I can't make a living. The place is going bankrupt. Uh, don't change anything, you know. Uh, you know, they want somehow the status quo to work. But the fact is when the status quo is failing, you've got to innovate. You've got to try something different. And we, we, tried, we showed how you could take a program like Shakespeare, the Shakespeare, it's the largest Shakespeare tour in history. Um, and for a fraction, a fraction of the cost that you would think that you could do this, you could not only do it, you could do it everywhere. And you do that, uh, as the old saying goes, many hands make light work. We would find co-sponsors in every community, um, mm -hmm. businesses, foundations, schools, uh, you know, municipalities, and we would bring it. You know, and millions of kids went to a Shakespeare performance for the first time. But it wasn't just the kids. We gave the, the companies uh, basically money to produce plays and to tour. We gave the actors paying work we brought theater to communities that does not, do not have theater. We provided the presenters in those communities with a surefire box office. Uh, we provided millions of kids with their first experience of live theater. And most important, we provided long-suffering high school English teachers uh, with something which basically 
brought Shakespeare to their, to their students. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could do this all on the same dime. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I, in New York and in LA, not so much now, but for a couple of years, whenever I went into like a, a certain kind of restaurant, somebody comes up and they go, are you Dana Joya? And I'd sort of say, are you a poet? They go, no, 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 I'm an actor. Thank you for that, <laughs> for the tour of, you know, Two Gentlemen of Verona. It was, the, you know, I was able to live for two years off the money I made off that tour, you know? Uh -huh. And so it felt good that, you know, yeah. I mean, we are in a situation where artists, young artists, young academics too, or would-be academics can't make a living. Yeah. You know, I mean, the culture and the economy has failed them. And I do think that with a little ingenuity, you can create uh, essentially opportunities mm -hmm. for people, for young artists to lead meaningful lives. You know, but there was such partisanship back in the 90s before you came, came in. I mean, and all the controversy about some of the projects, you know, the, the, the Christ with the urine on it and so forth. Suddenly, a lot of that conversation, oh, that controversy seemed to stop. Um, it didn't happen without effort. Um, uh, and I just wonder, suddenly, where, where did that controversy, where, why, why were the congressmen well, suddenly just quiet about when, all the when I was, controversy? Well, they weren't, you know, it, it took a while. I know that you yeah, were but there it in was, your office. When, when I went, I mean, I, for one of the reasons I, I could have stayed running the NEA. Um, hmm. One of the reasons I didn't was that for seven years, practically every weekend, I was traveling with a senator, a congressman, a governor, a cabinet member, you know, to go back to their towns, introduce them to their, their own arts people, build a, a coalition between them and, and, and the, you know, basically, mm -hmm. you know, could, and I was trying to create a new consensus, and it, it took my whole life. But the main thing was that when I went off there, you know, I'm in L.A., and all the people going, going you know, go in there and fight the good fight, you know, fight. And I, and I said to myself, fighting is the wrong metaphor. We're poets. We know we live by metaphors. The metaphor that we needed was reconciliation. And so what I was trying to do, and I think we were successful, was to, to say that, you know, uh, arts in the schools, arts in the communities is not a partisan issue. It is civic common sense. Mm -hmm. The communities that have this are, are communities in which uh, you want to live, in which new businesses you know, want to occupy. I mean, I mean, Minnesota many years ago created a kind of tithe for its corporations to support culture and education. And the reason they did this was that the people that ran Min Minneapolis and St. Paul were smart enough to know that unless they made those towns more interesting, their kids and their grandkids were gonna move away. So they created a town in which people would wanna live. Uh -huh. You know, and I think that's not a bad thing for any mayor yeah. to consider. Yeah, yeah. Well, wonderful. I'd like to turn to your poetry for just a little while. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes, and um, um, as I said at the start, there's really too much to talk about, but your poetry is essential here. Um, you're, you're often quite hard on yourself in your poems. Writing, for instance, in your third book, um, Interrogation at Noon, in the first stanza, and the poem continues in the same vein, just before noon, I often hear a voice, cool and insistent, whispering in my head, it is the better man I might have been who chronicles the life I never led. Um, so your interrogation of yourself, which you actually do in a lot of your poems, um, in an intensely confessional mode, um, is shocking at times. Would you go on? To, would you go so far as to say this poem, and others like it, is a kind of ars poetica? And if so, could you elaborate on the Augustine-like conceit you establish in this poem as a kind of starting point for well, writing? Well, see, you know, you know, some people are confessional poets with a capital C. Yeah. You know, I'm a confessional poet with a small c, having learned confession from Father Radahan, uh, you know, at St. Joseph's Parish. Uh, um, so, you know, and I'm Catholic, and uh, part, I think, of, the, of Catholic spirituality is the examination of conscience. Um, and, you know, you know, I always... Um, this is like in the 70s. I, 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 you know, I, I was gonna. I never wrote this essay, but I wanted to. It was it had a great title, which was the uh, uh, the the white male poem as a sexual self advertisement. Uh, 
um, you know, which would be this kind of complicated, you know, poem that was like, where people you you'd basically present yourself as a as a caring and sensitive lover of great creativity, uh, and and I think I've always respond, you know, I've really you know, you know um, tried in my poetry to be more critical of myself because if you can't criticize yourself, you're not going to see anything clearly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, but you know, that's what Hopkins, uh, we talked about John, Gerard Manley Hopkins or, uh, with yeah. somebody in the audience uh, you know, earlier and uh, thinking of, you know, if you think reading Hopkins poems, there's exultation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as well as despair. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like my poems to be dialectical. Mm -hmm. I like them to go from, you know, from high to low. And I think that's the kind of tension, that's the kind of drama. Right. You write a lot of persona poems, some dramatic monologues, as we mentioned earlier, and two of your um, um, more recent dramatic monologues, Haunted, The Homecoming, uh, which isn't as recent, um, are fascinating, not only for their dark narrative drive, but their psychological daring as well. In your essay, which you just wrote last year, The Catholic Writer Today, you write that the Catholic writer, and you don't include yourself in that list of Catholic writers, that was very self-effacing. Well, yeah, people say, why didn't, you, why didn't you talk about yourself yeah. in, the, in the essay? And I said, yeah, you know, because... <laughs> that contaminates it. Okay. It becomes self-serving then. Um, uh. But you say in that essay that you must have the passion, talent, and ingenuity to master the craft in strictly secular terms while never forgetting the spiritual possibilities of the art. As a Catholic poet, what role do you personally feel persona poems play as ironically viable explorations of faith? Poems in which your speakers say... Um, uh, uh, your speakers um, denounce the afterlife, um, commit murder. Hey, let, me, know, let, me, uh, let me read it, the opening of the sure. poem. This because you'll it, it's it, this actually poem was per, was performed by an actor. I love the last stanza you know, too. Twice. If you could read that. Well, it, this is a. It's a, the first three lines are in italics. It, it's a conversation somebody's hearing. I don't believe in ghosts, he said. Such nonsense. But years ago, I actually saw one. <laughs> he seemed quite serious, and so I asked. And then the poem begins, it happened almost 40 years ago. The world was different then, not just for ghosts. Slower, less frantic. You're too young to know life without cell phones, laptops, satellites. You didn't bring the world with you everywhere. Out in the country, you were quite alone. I was in love with Mara then, if love is the right word for that particular delusion. We were young. We thought we could create a life made only of peak moments. We laughed, we drank, we argued and made love. Our battles were Homeric, not Homer's heroes, but his gods, petty, arrogant Olympians thundering in their egotistic rage. And it becomes a poem about this affair he's having with this, we with this kind of you know, uh, wealthy girl and kind of being besotted you know, with, you know, with, with luxury. I can't, the, it, I, if I read the ending, it'll, it'll give the surprise ending away. I know, so, so I sh shouldn't read it? Uh, no, it's, okay. they gotta buy the right. book if they wanna know how it turns out. <laughs> Wait, oh, I will oh, come on. You know, I'll describe the, her the heroine, but you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll give you the thing, Mara, was brilliant, beautiful, refined. She'd walk into a room dressed for the evening and I would lose my breath. She seemed to shine as movie stars shine, made entirely of light. And did I mention she was rich <laughs> and cruel? Uh, but, yeah. but the thing is that... Uh, I watch, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, the poem is really... It's a poem about, it becomes a poem about, about love and sex and then it becomes a poem about money, and then it becomes a poem about the ghost. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, you realize what it was really about, because that's when you realize who's actually telling the poem, who's mm -hmm. actually speaking the poem. And I, and I thought it would be nice to have a poem with a surprise ending. You don't see those much. Uh, and, uh, well, I've but, wasted my life. That's the last one I can think yeah, of. Well, yeah, yeah, and, and, well, this is the life... I didn't want to waste is the last line. You That's know, the, right. Yeah, this is the this, this is the life, not the next one. This That's is the life. But my feeling is, so I've never really written a devotional poem. 
I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, some people can do this, I can't. Most mm. of the really, uh, really religious verse I see is not very good. Uh. But it does seem to me that if, if, if you have, if you have values, if you have a spiritual framework, if you have a worldview, it sort of shines through your work sideways. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, uh, you know, and so I think that, you know, this is a poem where, which actually by the end of it, begins to have a little, little bit more overt thing, but it's actually recited by a, a skeptic. Right. You know. Right. A devout believer of any faith might argue that the notion of a Catholic writer or Jewish writer or Baptist writer is, a, is an oxymoron, pitting the imagination against sovereign religious precepts, doctrine. How would you argue against this in a time when religious sensitivities are so volatile around the world? Well, there is a secular culture which has no religious roots. But the majority of humanity um, has deep roots. Now, for me, this includes, I mean, part of the reason I'm Catholic is I'm Italian, I'm Mexican. These were, are my people. Um, these are people who underwent extraordinary tragedies in their lives, enormous uh, challenges in their lives. Um, I am the first child of this tribe who was able to go to college, who was able to make something of himself that would be, pulled himself out of poverty. You know, I'm not going to turn my back on my people. Now, uh, I'm a very tribal person in that sense. I don't think that makes me intolerant. In fact, actually, I think it makes me, it was interesting. Um, at the end of my first lecture course at USC, um, a contingent, at the very last class, all of the Muslims came up to me as one group. Uh, and I said, oh God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> what, what did I say? And this, uh, she went to me and she goes, Professor Joya, we want to thank you. Uh, you know, I, I didn't teach in Muslim poets, and I was teaching E.A. Robinson and Robert Frost. Actually, mostly skeptics. Uh, she goes, but you are the only professor we've had at USC who understands the role that faith plays in people's lives. And I said, well, thank you. you know, I, mean, I, was, I, was, I wasn't expecting a compliment. Yeah. But I do think that, I mean, you know, when I was teaching, you know, like Robinson and Frost, Robinson especially, uh, you can see it, you know, some of the other ones. The, the difficulty, the challenge they had for Stevens to try to make sense in a world without a God, mm -hmm. you know, uh, was not a foregone conclusion, you know, for them. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think that uh, if I, I can only be who I am and try to be the, the, uh, the best version of it. It was interesting, the response that I got on, I got a huge, huge response on this Catholic essay. I mean, mm -hmm. the biggest response I got since Ken Poetry Matter, I was on 25 radio shows. But, uh, you know, besides Catholics, the people that wrote me about it at greatest length were Jews, you know, who understood what I was talking about, in a sense, even if they didn't believe, because I was writing Catholic writer for, even for people that aren't uh, <coughs> practicing Catholics, but have a Catholic worldview, have, you know, had a Catholic background, in a sense, the power that these frameworks of imaginations and morality, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, can bring to your life. Right. Well, I know it's not fashionable, but that's who I am. <laughs> um, what emotional role do you feel memory plays in your poem? And this, I think, redounds very directly and specifically in what you just said about your your tribe and your faith. Um, you immerse yourself deeply, often, in lamentations about past experience, wishing you had grasped more at certain moments, staring through the lens of time and asking yourself, what more could you have wanted? And answering everything. Where would you say the line exists between memory and emotion for you, if it exists at all? Well, To a certain degree, who we are is a recapitulation of everything we've experienced, or at least everything we've experienced that we can remember. And these memories, uh, you know, I lost my first son. And uh, 
I usually read at least one poem. I don't didn't write very much about that because I didn't want to overdo. It. I just wanted to write a couple, you know, a couple of things that talked about it. And there will be many people in the audience crying. Mm. Now, the sensible American perspective is get over it. You, know, you lost your kid 30 years ago. Get over it. You know, you lost. But it's not true. That's not what it means to be human, because these things are the are the experiences that shape us. And so the question is. And, you know, and I say this, this is a, actually, someone quoted this line to me in the bookstore, God bless her. She said that she loves my poem. This poem that Elijah likes, the trick uh, is making memory a blessing. You know, but I think in order to make the blessing, you have to, you know, uh, when my son died, I realized I could either try to repress it, which is what most American men are supposed to do, or I could take it, take the grief, take the sorrow, and see where it led me. Mm. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, he's actually Spanish, but Roman Empire, uh, said that if you resist your destiny, it drags you behind it. If you follow it, it guides you. Mm. And so it's the same thing about self-criticism. Uh, and Catholicism and Buddhism are very similar in that they believe that suffering is central to human existence. So rather than deny it, rather than wall it off and, and pretend it doesn't exist, you begin there. And that becomes the basis for joy and freedom and wisdom. So I can have, uh, when I think of my little boy that I lost, it, it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Because I've never turned my back on him. I hope you'll read Planting a Sequoia. I know it's an older poem, yeah. You know, it's a wonderful. Um, to quote Auden, I think you've answered this question um, already, but maybe you could answer it in, in a little more of a direct way. Um, in his poem, In Memory of W.B. Yeats, yeah. he writes, Mad Ireland, hurt you into poetry. What would you say hurt you into poetry? Mad California. <laughs> <laughs> no one will argue with that adjective. Uh, no, I, I mean, I was raised... Uh, I think you were. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a working-class neighborhood where most people didn't speak English as a, as a, at all or with a, a native language. Uh, you know, I had this vision of... I had this hunger for beauty, and it, you know, and it led me where I needed to go but I, play, I paid a price for it, you know I mean? You know, working 15 year, years, 10, 11 hours a day is a price for it. But the price uh, also let me feel its value. Mm -hmm. And I always go away from California to New York and Washington. I'm very successful and happy there. But California is kind of you know, where I'm from, so I go back there, which is a completely crazy, self-destructive, beautiful, irresistible state. I don't want to be anywhere else, you know. And let me ask you, it's because this California craziness is my craziness. <laughs> Last question, because I know a few folks want to ask you some questions. We do this uh, every, every year. Um, what are you writing now? And um, if you want to share that with us. Well, I, I've just put together my new and selected poems, which will be published by Grey Wolf next year. And uh, I gave it, I'm calling it 99 Poems new and selected, because I just gave myself the, the, that number, and I cut everything away. Because I figure, you know, uh, 99 poems is more than most people are going to want anyway. And E.E. You know, uh, e. Cummings once did 100 poems, I like that. I just like that collection. I bought it in high school, and I've never, I've always had it. And the other thing is I decided not to arrange it chronologically, but thematically. And it's because the, the critics, want the chronology, but the other 99.9% .9 of humanity does not. They want to know, is this going to be a sad poem, a happy poem, a love poem? And so uh, I've arranged it that way, which I think will probably annoy critics no end. But it just felt that, once again, somebody should shake the conventions of, of, of that. And then I'm, I'm, I've gone back to writing prose. Uh, I, I didn't, let me put this, uh, Government service kills brain cells. You know, I think um, I can interrupt you. No books between 2002 and 2009. I, um, 
when I took, I did not want the NEA job. I turned it down the first time it was offered mm. uh, because I didn't want to give up my writing. But I knew that if I was going to make it work, I had to give myself entirely to the job. Uh, I also think it's uh, not seemly for an arts, uh, a federal arts official to publish art or you know produce art uh, during the tenure. It would seem self-serving. Uh, but also, I had to. I made a. You know, I just told myself I will not do this. So I don't. It's not. You know. So part of the problem where we lose a lot of our energy is trying to figure out whether we do something or not. Because you know you can make a case to do something, not do it, something to say. But so you say you just lay down certain rules for yourself and just say that I'm not going to let myself go there. And I said I, I give, I grant myself permission to fail as an artist during these seven years. But when I left, my main concern was had I so destroyed my brain. Um, you know, because you're, you're playing a different game. It's like Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. He thought he could play baseball, but he couldn't, you know, uh, at the level that he would have to as a pro. You know, and so for the next couple of years, all I did was to get back to writing poems. Because I had to, in a sense, completely reconfigure my imagination. Because, you know, to talk to mayors and congressmen and senators, you have to, in a sense, put your mind, your heart, your imagination in a different place. It's not a bad place, but it's not where a poet is. Mm -hmm. so, so since the last couple of years, I've retaught myself to write poetry. And having done that, I now feel that I am capable of writing an intelligent paragraph again, although that's proven to be a stretch. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much.